Well, thank you, Adrian, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone who's joining us online today. It's a beautiful day here in Phoenix, Arizona. I hope uh, everybody that's joining us is enjoying a beautiful fall day wherever wherever you are. My name is Kelly Bounds, and I'm on the technical team here at ICM, and I'm joined by Scott Dumont, who heads up our sales organization. Good morning, Scott. Yes, hello, Kelly. So we have put together a quick 30-minute presentation for you today that hopefully will inform and, and maybe entertain a little bit as we go through it. Uh, the teaser for the webinar was how to find the best supplier support staff and, and pay them nothing. And so how exactly does that work? Um, so to start our webinar today, we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of history and, and hopefully entertain you a little bit, and then we'll get kind of get into the meat of the, the presentation. So <clears throat> any ideas what uh, Mr. Piggly Wiggly has to do with today's webinar? So Piggly Wiggly has been around for 100 years, uh, just, just recently celebrating their 100 year uh, centennial. And uh, this is about an invention that was patented 100 years ago, uh, uh, this year as a matter of fact. So this invention started a revolution in business that uh, even continues today. And what it is is called a self-serving store. So in 1917, Clarence Saunders, who was uh, one of the founders of Piggly Wiggly, uh, came up with an idea. And if you can imagine back to 1917, when you would uh, want some groceries, you'd actually take a list to the grocery store and present that to a clerk, and they would go get everything off of the shelf for you, which is kind of nice from a service standpoint. But Clarence Saunders came up with the idea, hey, you know, if we let all the customers pick the stuff off of the shore still shelves themselves, you know, we could save ourselves a lot of, uh, a lot of effort here and kind of put those uh, customers to work for us. And that will be the focus of today's uh, presentation is self-service and how that applies to a supplier portal or a vendor portal. So Piggly Wiggly, it's worked well for them. They've got over 600 stores going strong 100 years later. And some other examples of self-service, kind of looking back in time, in 1947, the first modern self-serve gas station went online, where else, of course, Los Angeles. And in fact, uh, you know, prior to that, just a little bit of trivia, trivia uh, gas stations were actually called fueling stations because they didn't offer anything beyond the fuel, but then they started to offer tires and oil changes, and that's when they became ser actual service stations. So that's kind of interesting. 1951, you could finally uh, dial your phone and get connected with where, wherever you wanted to without uh, using an operator. So the telephone company also recognizing the fact that they could you know, do much better by reducing the amount of uh, uh, employee effort they had on their site by putting that back on the user. 1969, the first automated teller machine uh, went online in uh, New York. And probably the best example of self-service kind of as a general platform in 1969, uh, you know, the Internet was born by uh, ARPANET. So, you know, as far as the platform goes, uh, really that just opened things wide open as far as self-service goes. Absolutely. Don't forget one giant leap for mankind that took place on uh, July 20th, 1969. That's 1969. Yep, we landed on the, on the moon. My favorite, my favorite uh, story about that is Buzz Aldrin uh, was very concerned, uh, and Neil Armstrong, when they got out of the lunar module, they said they fly 250,000 miles essentially across space. They finally get it landed. Their biggest concern was shutting the door on the lunar lander behind them because. To save weight, they didn't have a they didn't have a doorknob on the outside of it. So if the door closed while they were out walking around, they would have been in real trouble. I think that's interesting. Okay, so talking about uh, you know how this plays into to mobility, self service and mobility, smartphones in the world, tablets, devices like that, over two billion now, and it's it's interesting because just recently. Uh, last month, as a matter of fact, we kind of reached a tipping point, and that is as far as Internet traffic goes today, uh, we've reached the point where people going online with their desktops versus their, their mobile devices, well, mobile devices now are actually uh, generating more Internet traffic than, uh, than non-mobile devices. So we kind of reached that tipping point just recently. Okay? So 
how does this all play into self-service and a self-service portal for suppliers or vendors? And, and you know, how, how are we going to put them to work and, and be able to really lower our costs on, on that support effort? Um, before we get there, we'll do one trivia question regarding self-service. In which two, which two states are self-service gas stations prohibited by law? So there are two states where you can't actually fill up your own, your own car. So we have North Dakota and Maine, Rhode Island, New Jersey, or New Jersey and Oregon. And the answer is New Jersey and Oregon. So it's kind of neat. You pull up to the gas station there, people run out, fill it up for you. So as long as you can get some quick service, it's kind of a kind of a neat thing. But otherwise. All right. So let's talk about specifically now about supplier, uh, supplier portal, vendor portal, and kind of how that can help organizations. Uh, when we look at the AP staff in most organizations, we can see that you know those employees that are doing direct support of vendors, they spend an enormous amount of time dealing with uh, invoice inquiries that are coming in. So suppliers that you know uh, are are uh, you know a little bit nervous about getting payment, they're trying to manage their their cash flow, their their credit, their inventory, and so they're, they're calling all the time, basically. Depending on the organization, some organizations have many, many vendors. Uh, some organizations, not so much. Sometimes, you know, even though they've got a lot of product flowing through, they buy that product from just a few vendors. Other organizations, you know, have hundreds of thousands of vendors in play. So this creates, a, you know, a, an enormous pressure on the AP staff to basically respond to those inquiries. Um, you know, we're looking at the general average of, you know, somewhere in the 80% range for people that are doing that kind of support activity. Beyond that, we've got things like discrepancy resolution, uh, vendor master file updates, and, you know, and then some other activities on, on the tail end there. But this is really the elephant in the room, is the AP staff that's, that's answering uh, these phone calls. And the suppliers themselves are in the best position um, to understand what data they're trying to get at, what invoices they're most concerned with. And very often it's, it's, you know, it's not just one invoice. They're calling the AP group and they're asking about multiple invoices. And so that's taking the a AP staff, basically, and, you know, making them slaves of that, of that vendor community. So what we want to try to do in implementing a vendor portal is move away from that model and, you know, allow the vendors themselves to, to go ahead and find the data that they need, find the invoice information that they need, find out the status of those invoices as they go through the process. All right. So, you know, a, a byproduct of this, and it's, it's sad but true, is for many organizations when, when they're receiving those calls from their vendors, well, those invoices are, have just recently been paid, you know, within the last 48 hours, or they're in the process of uh, finalizing their processing, so they're, they're due to go out within the next seven days. So you've got all this traffic related around, you know, an answer that's going to come out of the AP group that, you know, just says, yeah, we, we, we just paid it, it's on its way, you're good, or, you know, it's, it's due to be paid in the next three or four days. And it, it's really wasted time for everybody. So in, in looking at putting a vendor portal, supplier portal online, and allowing the vendors to come in and do self-service, now you're able to move that portion of your staff, which percentage-wise can, can be quite large depending on the organization. You're going to, it allows you to move those vendor support people and move them you know, out of being just entirely cost-based as a cost center and move them more into kind of a revenue area. Now, it's not actual revenue, but when you look at it and you look at uh, the fact that those, that personnel can concentrate more on those areas within the AP area that allow them to do things that, for example, allow you to capture more discounts or to minimize your late payments. And during that whole process, of course, to improve your vendor relations because you're able to hopefully you know, accelerate those invoices through your process, whatever your internal process is, whether it's paper-based, whether it's electronic, but if you can keep those people focused on that, the rewards can be, um, can be huge. So that's, that's really the core of, you know, the benefit of putting that type of system on, online. Now, there are more benefits as well. We've talked simply about invoice inquiry, 
but a really full featured vendor portal, supplier portal, there are, there are several additional things that can be done within that environment. So we've talked about invoice inquiry. Uh, Self-service enrollment, if an organization has, has 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, however many vendors, you have the option uh, of creating a self-enrollment type environment so that vendors, uh, you can send out an email indicating what the endpoint is for them to become, uh, come into this portal and do self-service. And uh, by being clever about it, you can do, for example, things like solicit information from them that would include something like, okay, what's, you know, what is, what is, what is, what is the vendor? Who are you? And then, you know, can you provide a check number and a check date and a check amount of uh, a check that we have recently, uh, you know, cut to your organization, which is a very unique combination of, of, of data. And if they can do that, the system can automatically take that data, do a query against the ERP or data warehouse, wherever that invoice information, payment information is being stored. And if you get a match, then you can automatically enroll. You can assume that that vendor is who they say they are. You can automatically enroll that vendor in the system. So again, that takes the burden off of your AP staff to go ahead and actually do the keying to, to manually enter those uh, vendors into the system or to have your IT group create a load that uh, onboards those vendors. So, so that's an option. Again, pushing back on the vendors to go ahead and get themselves enrolled. Other things that they can do, for example, is updates to the vendor master file. So instead of trying to communicate via email, something like that, if an ad address information, for example, changes for a vendor, you can allow them to key that in. Typically, that process would obviously go through a little workflow where you'd have your AP staff, admin staff, reviewing that information to make sure that it looks correct, uh, validating it, and then updating the, the ERP directly, that type of thing. Smaller vendors, it's nice to be able to provide, especially smaller vendors, it's, be, it's nice to be able to provide web invoicing. So for those vendors now, instead of you know, generating the paper, sending the paper that presumably is either going to get passed around within the organization or is going to be scanned and then go through some workflow process, that type of thing, if vendors are allowed to use the web invoicing, it goes immediately into the system as, as digital information at that point and, and can go through the approval process, again, kind of accelerating that, that process. Self-service notification requests allow vendors to indicate that they want to be notified, for example, when invoices are paid. Data downloads, the data is king, and uh, it, it, that, that's no different for the vendors. So if they can basically do a search within the portal, get a list of uh, invoices that indicates the status of those, they can go ahead and download that and then import it into whatever type of analytic system that they have to look at. Discrepancy resolution, again, if it can be done right online through the portal, saving everybody from going through a big email chain or something like that, you get results much faster. And then finally, integrated dynamic discounting, which is, you know, we could, we could almost do a whole separate webinar on, on that itself, but we'll talk, about, we'll talk about that right here for a moment. So dynamic discounting uh, is, a, is a clever way to basically increase uh, your capture of, of discounts um, from vendors. And essentially how it works is vendors come into the portal, they're typically doing research on, on invoices, and when those invoices are presented that haven't been paid yet, uh, you can, the system can dynamically offer a discount uh, for that particular invoice. So let's say a, an invoice is maybe 20 days old, it's, uh, you know, it's got net 30 terms on it, you can go ahead and offer a discount, 1%, 2%, to get that payment out within 48 hours, uh, something like that. And essentially, you know, try to entice those vendors into giving a discount on that item. And, you know, a discount like 1% or 2%, I mean, compared to the cash pool, the money that a cash pool is typically making for an organization in terms of being invested or collecting interest in the accounts that it's sitting on, can be very, very substantial. So typically, those offers are made. They have short expiration times. You're going to have part of the staff as part of the cash management group who understands what the cash pool looks like. They have to have the ability to, uh, you know, basically uh, 
you set the configuration for how much discounts, how many discounts are going to be offered within a, you know, any period of time so that you can keep control of that. Uh, and one, one strategy that's being used by, by organizations is as hand in hand with the dynamic discounting is on a regular basis going back to your vendors and trying to, uh, you know, basically in, increase your stretch, in, increase your DTO so that if you have previously negotiated uh, you know, 2% 10 net 30 um, uh, terms with your vendor that you try to renegotiate that to maybe you know net 45 or net uh, 60 terms to try to push out that non-discounted uh, uh, stretch. And if you're able to do that, if an organization is able to do that, and, and that, that can take some time, but if you're able to do that, that makes the dynamic discounting even that much more interesting to your vendors because you think about it and now let's say 2% uh, 10 has been offered but you know the organization doing the processing here, the HE group, hasn't been able to um, push that invoice through the process, approval process within 10 days. But So now the invoice is at uh, let's say 30 days but there are net 60 terms for that particular vendor. Well, now offering a, a discount on that particular invoice when vendors come into the system because becomes much more enticing for the vendor because they're still looking at a 30-day stretch out until they're going to be paid for that item or you know, they can take advantage of a 1%, 2% discount, whatever it is, and, and be paid within uh, 48 hours. So those kind of two, two things go hand in hand, both uh, the ability to offer those discounts as well as managing those vendor contracts to try to increase uh, your net terms on, uh, you know, per your, per your vendor master agreement with those vendors. So it's, it's a pretty interesting way to, um, to, to really be able to capture many, many more discounts. So uh, today um, for, the, for the last part of the presentation, I would just like to go through some screenshots of a product that we have uh, at ICM here. Uh, we're talking about Supplier Portal. We have a product called Info Center, and we have an implementation of Supplier Portal on that, um, so it's a vertical product on top of that. And so now so that you can kind of visualize how this uh, would work in terms of having a Supplier Portal, you know, typically you're going to have a login screen, pretty standard stuff there. As we go through kind of these screenshots, also keep in mind that, for example, this product, and that's, you know, what you would want typically in any, in any supplier portal type product, all of the branding that you see here is configurable. So when this is set up for an organization, the logo can be uh, uploaded and changed, the text can be uh, changed to match their existing, uh, you know, portal in terms of the, the artwork and, and, and the theming and whatnot. So we'll just keep that in mind. Once the user logs into the system then, they have the ability to, this would be the vendor coming into the portal, they have some standard uh, filters set up basically for them. And of course this is all coordinated with whatever organization that the, the supplier portal is put online with. But here are some examples of typical tiles that we might have here. We've got all the paid invoices, unpaid invoices, and then they can just do their uh, searches, you know, based on based on invoice number, based on uh, you know if, if if they're looking to to correlate payments on an item, they can do lookups uh, for payments, that type of thing. So the user would typically, uh, you know, say, okay, show me in this particular case all my paid invoices. We get a listing of those items, and then in addition to the data that uh, of course exists within the workflow system, within the ERP, within the data warehouse, wherever that data is being stored they also have the ability to go ahead and, and view those items so that they can bring up the actual invoice image to kind of confirm that's the one that, uh, that's the particular invoice that they were interested in looking at, for example. Uh, and so now they've got access to both the image as well as the data so that they can, you know, they, they can have a sense of where that invoice is in process at that point in time. And so unpaid invoice, the same type of thing, a listing of that, and the ability to do just searches, so in searches based on the invoice number, for example, would be typical for, uh, for a vendor coming in. So they can get, again, all that data, have the ability to look at that information, here's where they've gone in and done a search on a particular invoice number and got the return on that. And I talked a little bit earlier about the branding. So the product is uh, very configurable. You're able to set you know, the logo that you want associated with the site. 
modify all of the text associated with the site, that type of thing. So it adapts very easily to uh, an existing, uh, an organization's existing uh, thing on their websites. And this is just where we, we're, again, looking through kind of some of the admin screens where all this can be set up. Um, another thing is it's very configurable in terms of uh, uh, specifying what search fields are allowed. So in this particular case, we're seeing the drop down to the search fields. Again, the administrative people would say, okay, we want to allow vendors to look things up by the invoice number, by the check number, et cetera. And those are the search fields that are presented. So it's, it's, it's very configurable, very dynamic um, for each organization, to, you know, depending on kind of how they want to have things set up. And this is the same thing for the results fields that come back, again, from the ERP or data warehouse, wherever this data uh, is uh, resides, to be able to indicate then what, uh, what fields are actually going to be presented as a result of the search. And we talked a little bit about enrollment earlier and automatic enrollment. So what we're looking at on this admin screen is basically the product kind of has three modalities in terms of authentication and, uh, you know, how vendors would be enrolled in the system. Um, for non-vendor type applications, we do have an option that's really kind of more of an intranet option for unrestricted uh, access that can be put online for, you know, for the, uh, people on staff in your organization if you want to allow that. But typically you'd either have some type of admin review or system review and that's where the vendors would either be put in manually essentially through the admin staff uh, and be reviewed there in a, in a little workflow that says yes we want to onboard this vendor or would be the one we call the system review and that's what I talked about earlier when we have challenge questions. Uh, can you indicate uh, you know, a check number and check date and check amount for uh, a check that you've received from us uh, recently. And if that, the system in the background will automatically check for that, do a query against the database, and if that looks good, then it'll go ahead and automatically onboard those, uh, those suppliers, those vendors. So different modalities. And uh, finally, you know, choosing your uh, repository, again, we've talked about the fact that this ERP information could be stored in a number of different places, and so we have the ability to to go ahead, and this is where you uh, also see plugins for uh, SAP, for Oracle Financials, for Great Plains, that type of thing. So the system, again, is configurable in terms of its connection to those different uh, repositories. And getting toward the end here, ho hopefully everybody's uh, still awake and stayed with us here. Uh, just to look at an example of how this can really benefit an organization. So um, we got a lot of math going on here, but essentially, uh, looking at a, an AP department, for example, so let's say has a two, uh, $200 million spend, um, and looking at kind of old numbers and new numbers where we've now transitioned from all of the support being done within the AP staff and kind of move that, push that out to the vendors to be able to do their own inquiries, and in the process taking those uh, AP staff members and having them concentrate on, on discounts and late, late payments. The kind of difference that it can make is, is, is pretty dramatic. So we've got have a company that um, you know is doing 200 million in spend, but let's say only 50% of the suppliers are offering discounts. So you know basically 100 million dollars is in play on, on the spend. But you know because of processing lags and whatnot, that an organization is only currently capturing 25% of uh, of those offered discounts. All right, that would result in a capture of uh, $500,000 for the sake of our argument. Late payment penalties using a number, let's say, overall of what remains, let's say, you know, you're, you're suffering from maybe a, a half of a percent of charge overall on, on the remaining, and you're paying, let's say, $875,000 in late payment penalties on, on that uh, 200 in, in, in spend every year. So let's say we could move now, uh, we can move those discounts uh, north and move from capturing 25% to 75% because we've got staff available to really concentrate on that, okay, our numbers now are, are going to go up and go up pretty dramatically, all right, and so now we're going to be at 1.5 million. And the same staff in reducing late payments instead of, you know, having half of a percent, maybe we can move to a quarter of a percent overall on the pay, on the um, late payments, now we can reduce our late payment penalties to $312,000. So looking at the overall improvement, okay, um, for our discount captures, we go move from 500,000 to be able to capture 1.5 million in discounts, and we move from reducing our late payment penalties from 875,000 to 312,000. Um, combined improvement now we're at 1.5 million dollars a year. 
So we've been able to just by having basically putting the suppliers to work for us and, and, and reimagining how our AP staff is going to operate internally, moving their focus over to discounts and late payments. We've and in addition to that, we've improved our supplier relations and our ability to negotiate with, with those suppliers. So we've created a very dramatic effect here in, in uh, you know, the that as a cost center, the AP area as a cost center. And that, Adrian, wraps up our presentation for today. Thank, thank you, Kelly. Uh, we have a couple questions here. Um, do you have an integration with any of the accounting systems? Yes, we do. Uh, we, the integration points for uh, Info Center with the supplier portal on top basically includes a couple of different areas, and it depends on the organization that we go in and do the integration. But you're looking at integration with the data side of things, so that's either going to be on the ERP side, if sometimes it's stored in a data warehouse, that type of thing, as well as content repository. So the images themselves of the invoices. So we have experience interfacing with SAP, Oracle Financials, Great Plains, uh, and several other. And I'm sure if uh, you didn't mention the ERP, is there any type of byway directional um, just through uh, any type of um, text file? Yeah, and that's, that again is part of the integration process. Uh, depending on the organization, uh, you know, sometimes organizations are comfortable with direct ERP integration to, you know, the production data. Uh, other times they're not. And so uh, typically they'll have a data warehouse or uh, just flat files where this information can be exported from the ERP or workflow system that we can integrate with. So you've got, you've got options there. And what is the just a ballpark estimate of cost for a typical system? Um, do you have you know smaller business options and medium-sized business options? Hey, Adrian, it's Scott. I'll take that one. Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, it, it certainly is uh, a, a very um, attractive. Uh, entry point into the market at uh, fifteen to twenty thousand dollar range, uh, and obviously the the level the level of integrations and where we're pulling that data from is what's going to impact the cost from there. So larger uh, larger companies typically have more than one integration point. Obviously that that's certainly going to increase the cost, but for a baseline self service portal, uh, we can certainly keep the, uh, the entry point at less than $20,000. And I think it's typically our, the ROI, and that's usually, ROI is usually between about 8 12 months for most organizations. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. And is there anything that really um, makes you guys stand out compared to the other document management systems? Is there um, key differentiators that you guys can just, you know, kind of point to? Um, from your solution compared to others in general? I think there's, uh, there's a couple that do stand out, uh, and we certainly hear this directly from our, our customer base as well. Uh, on the AP side, you know, having over 100 years of collective AP experience and dealing with small, medium, and large enterprises uh, from a best practice scenario really goes a long way. So that level of experience and subject matter expertise as it relates to AP automation uh, absolutely sets us apart. Uh, the, the second uh, area that we hear most often uh, is just the speed at which that we're able to implement. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it is a very rapid process uh, that is, is heavy on the discovery and requirements definition component of any uh, relationship that's established with our partners, uh, but it is uh, something that implements very quickly um, and uh, and can be available uh, to the suppliers in short order. And do you have a uh, partner program for Sage Partners? For Sage Partners, uh, currently we do not. 
but we are entertaining uh, conversations on uh, obviously mutually beneficial partnerships between our firm and and uh, and Sage Partners. So we're absolutely open to it, and would welcome uh, an initial conversation to discuss in more detail. So perfect. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Thank you, you two, for your fantastic presentation. And uh, we're going to be doing another one of these shortly. So please stay tuned, audience. Uh, we really appreciate you spending the time with us. And uh, Scott or Kelly, would you like to uh, finish with any closing remarks? Yeah, absolutely. Adrian, thank you uh, again for the opportunity to present. Uh, always a pleasure, and uh, hope everyone was able to find something valuable in the information that we presented today. And, and we certainly would encourage uh, our participants to visit our website at www.icmdocs.com for more information about our company and our products. Uh, thank you very much. All right, everybody. Hey, thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Adrian. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.